I would also like to thank Bea and Brad and all the other organizers for, for getting this conference and for inviting me. Uh, I will be talking about working memory um, um, and in particular visual spatial working memory which could be defined as the ability to retain spatial information during a short period of time based on a continuous prefrontal and parietal neuronal activation. An example uh, is up here to your left. Uh, targets are indicated in a sequential order and you retain those in working memory. Here is typical activation in a uh, developmental sample, of prefrontal activations, parietal activation, occipital activations. And here is um, behavioral data in months here, so it starts at six years of age and, and plateaus somewhere around 20 to 25 years of age in capacity on a task like this. And you can see this developmental um, aspect as well as the large variability here. And this uh, variability is very interesting. So it turns out that even these simple working memory tasks, they can predict a lot of things. Um, working memory capacity is associated with inattentive symptoms in ADHD, which predicts future academic performance. And working memory capacity predicts future math performance, independently of IQ. And Parietal brain activity during working memory performance predicts future math performance. <coughs> now, the next question becomes, what predicts future working memory capacity? So there has been a lot of imaging on working memory development. Um, it's shown uh, that uh, increased capacity is correlated with increased bowl activity in frontal and parietal cortex. Uh, it's correlated with maturation of frontoparietal white matter tracts, most often measured as increases in, in fractional and isotropy. Um, it's correlated with cortical thinning in frontal and parietal regions. Um, however, most of these analyses are cross-sectional and uh, few, if any, are making predictions uh, of future performance based on imaging. So that's what we wanted to try out. And we have a sample here, uh, which we call the brainchild study. It's children between six and uh, up to young adults of 20 and 24 years of age. Um, they are a random sample from the population registry in, in a small city close to Stockholm. Um, so we have met these children several times. Um, so they have uh, participated up to three times, uh, where we have uh, performed cognitive testing, we've done genetics, looked at mathematics, uh, etc., and done scanning, functional, structural, and, and DTI. So today I'll present two studies only. The first one uh, is a support vector regression analysis, a multivariate analysis headed by uh, Henrik Ullmann there. And the second one uh, uses anatomically defined ROIs based on track tracing, headed by Fahim Darki. So in the first study, um, we had 60 typically developing 60 to 20 year olds. We had behavioral data from time point one and time point two, and it was two years between T1 and T2. We look at this visual spatial working memory task and we have the neuroimaging data at time point one, and it consists of structural MRI, functional MRI during performance of a visual spatial working memory task, and, and DTI data. Um, and what we used is a multivariate approach with a support vector regression where you train a model and you validate it by leave one out cross validation. Uh, for the fMRI, we covary out all movement parameters in the, during the pre-processing, but we also do a sanity check in, in the end to see that the, any predictions do not correlate with the quantified movements. So first of all, we just looked at the data from t time point one 
try to see does it at all correlate with the with, uh, performance on the working memory task two years later. And we do get correlations for both the bold data, the fraction and anisotropy from the DTI, and the gray matter density from the structural MRI. Then we want to put together these data. And we did that by taking the predictions from each of the models and putting them into the same uh, multiple regression model. Uh, when we do that, we can see that uh, the gray matter density did not uh, contribute any unique variance, but both the bold and the FA uh, did independently. And overall, it's an R value of 0.64. Then uh, we did one step further and added the behavioral measure at baseline. So that's the question of could the MRI data tell us anything up and above uh, the baseline measures of the work memory measures. And it turned out that it did. So when we're trying to predict uh, visual spatial work memory capacity at time point two, we have the most strong prediction from, of course, the baseline performance of the same task. But here, uh, the MRI data also uh, contributes with unique variance. In contrast, when we add additional measures from other working memory tasks, backwards digits, a three-back task, does not contribute any more significant data uh, variance, not uh, from Raven, and age is not significant either. Uh, then we also localized uh, the, the signal that um, contributed this prediction. So first, so this is a Venn diagram of variance. So first we looked at um, variance correlating to T1, visual spatial work memory capacity. And here we again see um, the expected areas in the parietal cortex and the superior frontal sulcus here. Then we wanted to look at this aspect here. So that is what of, of the prediction is not explained by baseline capacity. And then the picture looks very different. We have only subcortical areas here. So we have uh, the thalamus and the caudate and white matter around the basal ganglia and also uh, higher up. So this shows that um, we can predict visual spatial working memory two years later, uh, and MRI can add unique variants on top of behavioral measures, and that there seems to be difference in localization between current capacity and those signals predicting future capacity. So in study two, uh, we have more data. We have up to three time points uh, that we uh, put together in analysis. So these subjects have participated between one and three times, uh, two years intervals. We have again the same visual spatial working memory data and, and functional uh, structural and DTI data. So in this study, we started with a functionally defined regions of interest. So it is based on the main effect of working memory in the superior frontal sulcus, in the parietal cortex, and uh, which you can see here in the basal ganglia. And then Fahime did tract tracing to identify frontoparietal networks as well as striatofrontal uh, networks here. And extracted uh, from the cortical and subcortical measures both the bold contrast during work memory performance and cortical thickness, and for the chordate also volume. And for the white, from the white matter, we looked at volume, or uh, in this case, white matter density and fractional anisotropy. So first, let's look at a cross-sectional analysis. Uh, and we used a mixed linear model here considering uh, the repeated measures. So here is a cartoon representing the results. So uh, these, it's just one parietal region, but here the red represents the bold values and gray represents uh, the gray matter density. 
and, and these lines here represent significant correlations. So what we see here, for example, then, is that we have significant correlation between parietal bold and working memory capacity, also between frontal bold and working memory capacity. Um, we have connections between both uh, straight to frontal white matter, both measured with as white, white matter volume and fractional anisotropy. They both correlate to, to performance, uh, as well as the straight to frontal white matter tracts, but not uh, the chordate, not uh, the bold activity, not the volume of the chordate. We also see some interesting correlation between structures here. So uh, the volume of the chordate correlates with FA and white matter density in the straight to frontal uh, pathway here. Next, we, yes, we also did this uh, correcting for age. I think there are both advantages and disadvantages in, in taking the way the effect of age in a developmental sample. Um, but here, this is the results after taking away the effect of age. Uh, the strongest um, correlation here is, is still uh, in the parietal bold activity correlating with uh, the performance. Now, we look at the longitudinal analysis. We predict future working memory capacity, again, in a mixed linear model, considering two repeated measures. And then the pictures look, uh, picture look very different. So the parietal, which was the strongest association before, is not at all significant. The, the uh, frontal parietal uh, con connections, as well as the striatal frontal connections, are still uh, significant. But now we also see the contribution of the chordate. Um, and this also, you can do this with or without taking the way of effect of age or, or baseline um, capacity here. So this is, again, look, showing a very different pattern, whether you correlate to current capacity and whether you're trying to predict future capacity. And it's interesting to try to relate this to, to basal ganglia functions. Uh, basal ganglia, uh, they are doing a lot of things, of course. But in this context, it's interesting to look at the, the functions relating to, to learning. Uh, we know that they are um, part, uh, important for implicit learning, for habit formation. Um, there is a very interesting study uh, by Pasupatu and Miller uh, showing that in a delayed response task, when you change the rules, the basal ganglia changes its activity much before uh, the cort cortex changes its activity. So it's as if uh, the basal ganglia is teaching the slower Hebbian learning uh, in cortex, and it's the cortical response that correlates with the behavior, not the basal ganglia, but they precede the cortical response. Um, when, they, when Ericsson uh, tried to predict video game learning, uh, the basal ganglia were the most uh, predictive um, part that they could find. And it also is uh, involved in working memory training. In the Olesen et al. study, uh, we did not differentiate between trying to predict uh, success of training versus just correlating capacity. And we had both frontal parietal, but also uh, chordate uh, activity. Uh, in the Dalin study, they really singled out uh, the basal ganglia. And then there are some new studies. The most recent one uh, by Stina Söderqvist, uh, looking at SNPs that predict success during uh, working memory training. And the strongest response is from DRD2. There are also earlier studies uh, singling out the DAT1 transporter. And they are both located to uh, the basal ganglia, or preferentially expressed uh, in, in the basal ganglia. So all of this could possibly uh, make a story uh, together with these uh, developmental findings. So to conclude, um, it seems to be two, could be two different system here, frontal parietal regions associated with current capacity in basal ganglia and straight to frontal connectivity um, predicting kind of a latent capacity. So this would be a, a novel aspect of working memory development 
uh, and it suggests a unique role for neuroimaging. So we, we touched upon this question yesterday, why put kids in a scanner if you can get the same information with a five minute paper and, and pencil test? But I think there is hope that we could uh, say something more uh, with imaging that you can't get at with behavioral measures only. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, all of my collaborators, especially Fahime, Henrik and Rita here. Thanks. Uh, if different structures predict different aspects of working memory, or? The high versus the frontal parietal tracks, they're both predicting accuracy or growth accuracy on the past, but are they predicting different dimensions of the behavior? It's an interesting, in, in, yeah, it's an inter the question was whether they, different structures predict different aspects of working memory development. I don't know, we, we haven't, it's an interesting question, we haven't looked at that, we, this is uh, just a start, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to look at that. Bea? Uh, so, I, what do you think it means that the other working memory tasks that you have, like digispan, et cetera, uh, were not, not able to be predicted? In other words, I think similar to what Bruce was asking, is there something very specific to the working memory tasks that you use? Because, you know, you, one would have thought that the other tasks would have also been predicted. Well, I'm, I'm sure they are, but they are not, they, they, they co-vary so much with the task that we used, the, the, the baseline task. So they did, they did not predict anything unique on top of that. Only the MRI did. Okay, thanks. <laughs>